Hey everybody, this is Tom Lynn, and I'm here with another interview that I did through Media Bridges a few years ago in Cincinnati, Ohio. This with, uh, unfortunately no longer with us, Alexander Coburn, who was for a long time uh, one of the editors at Counterpunch, a newsletter in our website, counterpunch.org. Unfortunately, Alexander is no longer with us. Last year, he passed away. And so there's a kind of poignancy which attends this particular talk. But I, I think I think you'll find it uh, stimulating. So I hope I hope you enjoy. Hello? Hey there, here I am. Here we are. Outstanding. Sorry, a bit late. Uh, no, no, you're quite all right. Uh, can you hear me all right? I can. All right, and I think you're coming through fine here. So, uh, Alexander, thanks a lot again for being on uh, the program. I was just... Uh, Reviewing uh, some of the motivations for having your person, and uh, one of the chief ones being your uh, role with regard to Counterpunch. One of the uh, efforts on this program is to provide an analysis which strives to get beneath the surface, but the surface is substantially what you're going to receive at best from mainstream media outlets, whether that be uh, CNN or MSNBC or, you know, you could hedge about that definition somewhat, but I thought as an opening question, just to get right into it, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the founding of Counterpunch and uh, how it's motivated or its relationship with how you conceive of um, the motive of a journalist or the, the intent of the fourth estate, and you could sort of maybe talk about what Counterpunch tries to do positively in terms of providing an account of what's going on in the world and how you would relate that account as it provides it with, let us say, alternative... Hey, that's a huge string. I can't even remember what the first bit was now. <laughs> I'm sorry. So you just pop in when you... When you uh, uh, first of all, I think, what, the founding of Counterpunch. Well, uh, that founding was about, I think, we're 16 years old now. I, had, I was working at The Nation, or well, I still do, and my intern at that time was Ken Silverstein, who now is the Washington editor of Harper's. And Ken and I often talked about launching a, a, you know, a, a newsletter. And then Ken went off to Brazil, and he was the AP guy in Brazil for a while. This was in the, what, this would have been 15, what are we now? Yeah, about the middle, early 90s. And then... Um, uh, he came back and he said, well, I'm going to start it. And I said, all right, you start it. And if, it ro if the raft floats, I'll step aboard. And if it doesn't, then I won't. And you'll, be, you'll do something else. But, so he, he got the newsletter going. And then after about the first, well, I wrote from the first issue. And then it, and then it kept going as a newsletter. And so we made, you know, really, really began to put it out every couple of weeks. And this was no, this was no website then. And uh, running a newsletter, it's a tough it's a tough job to get a circulation of a newsletter up. You have to buy zip codes from the nation, you know, nation lists, and that costs a lot of money. But we, we built up a circulation up towards somewhere between five and 10,000 and got a nice audience, and we had some great stories. And then in the uh, middle 90s, um, late, mid to later 90s, um, Jeffrey St. Clair came aboard, and Jeffrey was very, he's about... 20 years, he, he was much more conversant with the web. And it's Jeffrey who get, began to give us a web presence, which in the end became our dominant presence. Although we, you know, part of our, we don't raise too much money ex outside ourselves, but, you know, with foundations, most foundations don't want to give us a dime. But we managed to get a very good audience. By the 2000, we had a big, big, we still have a big, big web audience about uh, two to three million unique visitors a month. And the newsletter goes along and is a nice little revenue so source for us. And um, I think really what happened is that we began to command, the, you know, between the various left-wing websites. We, of course, offer nothing but original, almost nothing but original material. Um, most sites like Alternet, well, you know, they, they reprint stuff from the Times or Washington Post or for alternative publications. But I would say 99% of our stuff is original material. And how does, it, uh, how does it equate with what I want to do or what Jeffrey and I would want to do? Well, it, it is politically radical. 
It has no illusions about the Democratic Party. Um, it has a good international people writing for it. Uh, we try and keep the language lively. We're not particularly PC. Um, you know, we just try and do good, strong, gritty writing. We and stress on economics and things like that. Right. And I was going to say, maybe you could elaborate upon your conception of political radicality. As you said, you have no illusions about the Democratic Party. But, well, uh, you know, political radical, radical, you know, Lenin said to some guy once, um, be as radical as reality itself. You know, you can't, a lot of these sites on the left, even now, they're still pretty reluctant to go after Obama. I mean, I, perhaps even more than Jeffrey, I never trusted Obama. I never particularly liked him from the get-go back in 19, 2006. And, uh, of course, neither Jeffrey nor I would have any illusions about the Democratic Party. So our job primarily is is to highlight, you know, what, what a, to say the unassailable, defend the indefensible in some ways. Right. And really, tr the, the left has got becalmed in a kind of petrified alarmism, it, uh, uh, which I find very demoralizing. No. And try and remind people of what the fundamentals of the game are, which is political economy, political action. So there's a few different things that we could go from. Uh, one being this phenomenon uh, that there is a reluctance on the left uh, to to criticize Obama in anything but the meekest terms. And uh, maybe you could tell me what you think about that phenomenon. You know, on the right, you have these really almost uh, comical assertions like Obama. They're comical for anyone who bothers to look up what a socialist is in the, in the dictionary. Uh, you know, that Obama is a socialist and so forth, you know. Um, perhaps you could elaborate on why do you think the, the left is so hesitant to launch a more stalwart critique of Obama when across the board his administration has pursued actively or passively uh, policies that seem to fly in the face of uh, authentic uh, left orientation? Well, I think that... the first part of the answer would be that there's very little of a real left le left, you know. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, a lot of people on the left came out of the, you know, the Marxist groups and they got some basic education in political economy. Some of them had read Capital. And I, I don't want to sound like some old, uh, old, uh, uh, you know, uh, jitney <laughs> saying go read Capital. But it is important to grasp the basic realities of how our political economy works and to, to learn about, you know, what the role of capital is, what the role of labor is. You need fundamental education. And because of the collapse of, you know, well, in some ways because of the collapse of the organized communist left in the 80s and 90s, collapse of the Soviet Union with all its ghastly faults and so forth, um, the, the, the old left has got increasingly marginalized. And... I think a lot of a lot of uh, thought on the, what passes for the left now is sort of increasingly taken up with sort of uh, well, I think the whole we don't even get into it. The whole climate thing as a substitute for politics uh, has been tremendously damaging. I mean, we can. Secondly, actually... I think the role of the nonprofits is not to be underestimated here. A tremendous amount of progressive politics, so-called, is financed by nonprofits. Just run your eye down the environmental movement, the social justice movement, and you'll find eight or nine or ten or twenty nonprofits in there. The nonprofits are politically extremely cautious and very often downright reactionary in their fundamental policy. Once you're hooked into a nonprofit income source, a lot of people don't want to see their annual grant money endangered. I mean, for example, a posture on if you take an aggressive posture towards the hideous treatment the Israelis meet out to the Palestinians, immediately you're putting, if you're getting a grant from someone, you're putting that at risk probably because I would say 90% of the non-profits in the, here in America would, would be extremely wary of anything they regarded as you know, untoward criticism of Israel. But these are very important factors in how a, a left really develops. Uh, now, I, I, I think that those are all, uh, you know, very cogent points. 
I would actually want to come back to, as you said, the importance of reassessing our conceptions of political economy, you know, and, uh, well, one thing that's kind of interesting is how you said, oh, I don't want to sound, you know, I think you said like an old, uh, are you an old jitney or whatnot and go read Capital or whatever, which the fact that there's actually a reticence to engage those classical classical texts uh, in American culture at large actually I think reflects a sort of stream of anti-intellectualism that itself could be a topic of consideration. But to get back to the notion of political economy, maybe you could talk about how most so-called economic talk is ultimately impoverished. It sort of it resides and relies on, you know, marginal utility theory and so forth, and a preoccupation with the so-called sphere of circulation. I think one of the crucial distinctions, and you can get this even if you only read like the first few chapters of Capital, is the distinction between the production sphere and the circulation sphere, and when and and how value really originates in the former, that is the production sphere, with labor. Uh, but that even though it's a relatively basic concept for Marxian, and it wasn't originally Marxian, it's actually, you know, Smithian or Ricardo, that Marx innovates the concept somewhat, okay. But that sort of dropped out of any conversation to which I have real witness, unless you're reading, like, the monthly review or something like that. So maybe, uh, you know, in terms of political economy, could you elaborate what do you think is important in terms of insights of classical political economy that is lost in contemporary uh, economic discourse? Well, I mean, look, on our website, we try and run a fair amount of economics. And who have we got? Now, 30 years ago, I used to go and address meetings of the Union of Radical Political Economists, uh, partly organized by Poland, who's now at UMass Amherst. And there used to be maybe audiences at their summer schools of three to four to five hundred young people. Now, if you look across the country now and you try and write down the left, I'm not even saying Marxist political economists, but radical political economists who can write in an accessible language, communicating to our audience, which is a well-educated international audience, that's fingers of one hand, maybe two. In other words, what happened to all those five or 600 kids every summer? Did they all go and work for the, for the investment banks? Probably some of them did. So we can count now on uh, Michael Hudson, you know, who has a sound Marxist training. He was also a banker. He, he is a very sophisticated economist. You've got Dean Baker and you've got Mark Weisbrot. I've known Dean and Mark since the 80s when... Weisbrot managed Dean Baker's challenge to a right-wing Democrat in the state of Michigan. You've got maybe two or three others, and that's it. So the level, the available analysis, you've got no one like Paul Sweezy is long gone. The current monthly review has collapsed into, you know, climate hysteria, largely, as indeed has New Left Review to a certain extent. You know, with Mike Davis's, I like Mike, but his stuff on global climate warming and all that is complete drivel. And so gradually, political and economic stuff, because I'm not, you know, you sound like you know a lot more about it than I do. Oh, I don't know about that, but I'm but, just trying to. But go you know, on. there's just very little available, meaning that the economics departments, I think, the what, the economic department at UMass Amherst is good. There's a place at Utah is good. Um, let's see, there's a good... <clears throat> people at Buffalo. I mean, we're talking about the length and breadth of the United States. It's just awful. Right. I the think... most popular writer on our website for a long time was, was Paul Craig Roberts, right. who was number two in the Reagan Treasury. Indeed. Now, he has actually read Marx, right. but he's certainly not a Marxist. And he just uh, published a book with you he, We guys, published what, his book, you know, on, on economics. How a lot the of it economy is very, very was good. lost, I think. Beg your pardon? How the economy was lost how the economy is lost. He, um, first of all, he's a very clear writer. He's a brilliant pamphleteer. And, you know, and he, 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 he you know, has a rounded, radical stance with some features of it that many leftists would not like. We have always reached out, actually, you know, as much as we can to, you know, the libertarian anti-war movement, 
the uh, a lot of people con- protecting constitutional rights could, were certainly not leftists and some of our more like PC readers say why are you printing these people we say look you know we haven't got there's not too much of us out there we need to form coalitions where we can so but, if i could just try and recapitulate your response uh are you saying then that what you really have really have is an actual poverty of people uh who can address economic questions from a leftist perspective uh, with the intellectual um, framework. It's not that these people don't exist, but they exist in, in scant numbers. And Very scant numbers. So if you want someone to give the big picture, you know, across the board, whether it's issues of labor, whether it's issues of trade, whether it's issues of, you know, sovereign currency and so on and so forth, your your, your pool of of available writers is very difficult. Now, that's obviously not delving into intellectual traditions, intellectual stances. It's just saying if you're running a militant, well, an active left site. But I actually think it connects to a broader problem within academia that may also tie into the nonprofit issue that you highlighted earlier, where funding sources uh, ultimately uh, drive the ideologies that get sponsored or, you know, the... Uh, and as if you you know there's a parallel uh, occurrence in academic philosophy and broadly in anglo american universities you have a dominance of the analytic tradition which takes its cue from uh, linguistics and epistemology and so forth and it's to the detriment of scholarship in the so-called continental tradition you know obviously those kinds of distinctions are always always provisional but it's the continental tradition where you uh, find people like Foucault or Derrida or Camus or Sartre or uh, even someone like Habermas. Okay, but you don't. These people don't don't get read. Or if you want to, you have to go read them on your own, uh, with a uh, few exceptions. And it you know it comes back, I think, to the funding question and uh, and how universities get funded. Would you say that 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 is a a fair rendering? Yeah, I think that's right. That sounds right. And uh, so, how you know that's sort of a political economic broadly, but um, in terms of political action, you know, we already started to answer that with the issue of coalition. Uh, but how do you think the left as a whole can go about remedying the situation where, because they're hamstrung in virtue of the fact that most of the money is connected toward uh, people who are conscious of the need to maintain what are ultimately um, rightist. Uh, perspectives um how, how does the the left how, do, how does it happen i don't know there seems to be i mean look at 2003 you had you had a pretty robust anti-war movement did you not you I, know, yes i suppose huge what happened to that i mean i you could argue you could go back into clinton time and you could argue that the failure of the left to rally in sufficient numbers against the nato attack on yugoslavia was uh, you know broke into a certain extent well, that was a sort of disaster, I think. Um, and then, you know, liberal interventionism is an extremely powerful current. Um, you know, you can, uh, this is not left now, but, you know, look at the aftermath of these WikiLeaks disclosures. I mean, there was the nation's Chris Hayes was on substituting for Maddo last night on MSNBC. Mm-hmm. He spent a good deal of his segment denouncing WikiLeaks for actually doing it in the first place, saying it was irresponsible. Can you imagine? That's outrageous. I'm it's sorry. Completely outrageous. I a mean, lot of people, when you scratch them, they, they are interventionists, liberal interventionists. I mean... Um, so the, there seems to be, and I think Obama, you know, I think hopefully, I mean, how, how, how long can it go on? When people don't realize that Obama is, you know, fully, <laughs> fully accredited functionary of empire. And I, I would have thought, how, if people can't realize that the White House can't even rally to the defense of the, uh, you know, uh, Sherrod, you know, of the, um, of the USDA, who is fired by these knee, knee, that knee-jerk way they fired up on the basis of a faked right-wing uh, manipulation of her speech. This is the woman who told the parable about the white farmer, and she was accused of racism. Right. There's a, there's the White House inhabited by uh, Barack Obama. 
All right. And they don't even know enough civil rights history to know that her husband Sherrod was a famous civil rights figure. Well, I mean, I mean that's even actually a relatively minor example, as as you know, of what's oh, been yeah, going on. Oh yeah, I just happened to the, bring the latest one up. I, I mean, uh, there's. Uh, you could look at what's happened with Lynn Stewart. I think an out, an absolute, an egregious outrage, uh, yeah. where you know she's now. Last I heard, she was sentenced to ten years. I think she's going to appeal it, but I don't know if that's gone through yet or not. Or you know, just you know, people. I mean, you didn't think it was possible to 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 conceive of an administration that would best the Bush administration in terms of gutting. Uh, civil liberties, but the reality is, if you're following it, and this is one of the values of a site like Counterpunch, because outside of Counterpunch or a few other places, like uh, Chris Floyd, he does some good stuff on his blog. Okay. Um, yeah, we run Chris. He's good. Uh, I mean, I think we've got over the years. I mean, where else are a lot of these people going to go? They come to us because <laughs> or that's look what at, we do, kind like of thing. Obama's funding of nuclear energy. Well, that's a good example. Uh, Obama, I mean, it's a big, powerful example. I mean, I have always said, uh, we probably don't want to get into the merits of well, the theory actually, of if ant- you want to, climate change. If you want to, we, I, we've got about 20-some minutes before well, you have to go. Maybe, it's, maybe another time. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I'm... Leaving a, I mean, I think the science shows that there's, there's uh, zero evidence of, of uh, human import into climate change. So far, zero evidence. <sighs> I'm well, that's sure that a, that's a very a lot of your listeners. I'm sorry. But uh, I've always said, and whether or not you agree with that, that the whole of the AGW climate change movement was really, in the end, going to serve as a stalking horse for the nuclear power industry and for the coal industry uh, with so-called clean coal. What happens? Earlier this year, Obama said, yes, the feds would... Uh, handle the insurance for two new nuclear power plants down in the southeast, both located in largely black areas, I might say, localities. Then you go there. Here, after all, for 25 years, it's been absolutely a given of the environmental movement that they will, they will root and branch um, attack the idea of you know, the, the construction of new nuclear plants. And that after Three Mile Island, that whole industry was effectively dead. If you go back now and look at the statements of the major environmental organizations in the wake of the Obama statement on, on backing nuclear power plants, you'll find mute or meekness to a truly incredible degree. They've yeah, made I, no fuss. I mean, I, I, I would concur. I, I find it shocking. I, uh, and that was the absolute direct consequence of the, the climate change thing. That was the stalking no. horse also for cap and trade. And, you know, capitalism needs these methods of creating funny money. It needs endless places for new investment. Now, there's, I'm sorry, uh, I, I agree, and uh, cap and trade is ludicrous. And actually, what it does is it even, it just, it, it grants a legitimacy to uh, actions which are clearly problematic, to put it mildly. Um, Entirely, you know, you, 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 if you want to go buy a, a, an airline ticket to London, British Airways, <laughs> they'll immediately tell you what your carbon bill is. I mean, it's all, the demonization of carbon is another source of absolute public insanity, but, but there it is. I mean, now, there's... what happens then? You, you, in a, you, you agree, and then they, what do they do? They, they, ultimately, what happens in the cap-and-trade equations is that they ki- cut down a peasant's small peasants farm in in Brazil and build a eucalyptus grove which they which then becomes an investment tool in the cap and trade industry right. i mean it's absolutely horrifying yes you know, and did similar things happen with ethanol and all that but i mean i, I want to ask you a question about that though okay i mean it seems that there's enough logical space that something else could be going on all right now i don't have the data in front of me so we can't really have a meaningful discussion relative to um, the viability of the so-called uh, anthropogenic hypothesis. Okay, but well, it you seems... you want me to lay something out quickly for you? I'm sorry? Do you want me to lay something out quickly on that whole area for you? Well, you can, but let me go ahead and finish my question very quickly. Um, I was going to say, it's it possible that the anthropogenic hypothesis has some viability, but... What's happening is that 
establishment interest, for the lack of a better word, is appropriating the reality of that viability in order to uh, create these words, schemes. In other words, they took a good idea and perverted it. For yes. Their own in other words, even though cap and trade is horrifying, and uh, ethanol and all those scams are horrifying, and nuclear and clean coal are all scams, that the world is getting hotter, and we should do something about it. Right. Okay. How do you respond to that? And then, I mean, you may well, have. First said of all, that the world it. isn't getting hotter since 1988. 1998, it's been getting colder. Secondly, the theory of anthropogenic change is premised on the fact that we, the world is experiencing unparalleled levels of heating, and that is due to uh, industrial civilization. Uh, there's a famous debate called the hockey stick argument, which was originally put up by Al Gore. Mm -hmm. His personal life now currently is in ruins, I'm glad to say, <laughs> given this hypocrisy on almost every level in which people have for long pointed out that there have been several periods, geologists, climatologists, who haven't been actually brought up. That's another thing, by the way. In the whole climate debate, if you are a skeptic about climate change and you're putting in to, be a, uh, to go into the physics department or the uh, atmospheric physics department or the climate department of any university or foundation, if you are a skeptic, your chances of getting accepted or tenure are pretty much zero. Because the money, the money is now all coming from the AGW lobby. The five major climate analysis places are, have get huge scads of money from the climate change industry. In other words, that is the preference at the moment. So the debate, it's as though, you know, all debate on, you know, the mini of Christianity in the Middle Ages was controlled largely by the Vatican. The Vatican is now the climate change people. So the, the skeptics, skeptics, which are normally portrayed, you know, as huge, evil oil companies, the oil companies caught the change in the weather years ago. British Petroleum has a center at Berkeley, a $500 million center, devote, you know, trying to greenwash itself very successfully. The day that the oil well blew in the Gulf of Mexico, BP had an ad on the back of the nation magazine. I mean, that's a, just a graphic illustration. Mm -hmm. However, any, anyone with any honesty in the history of climate will tell you that there have been at least four or five periods in, within measurable analysis when it was a lot warmer. The medieval warm period, running from roughly 900 A.D. to about 1250, they had much higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. The temperatures were much warmer. This was not a time when they were driving up and down the interstate in England, mm -hmm. or the United States for that matter. They were farming in Greenland. No. The climate change people, the only thing they could do was wipe out the medieval warming period, which they did. So the hist it's very hard to find an honest geologist who will agree about anthropogenic global warming. Most of them absolutely don't, because they've seen too much evidence in terms of what they look at over very long periods of time. Mm -hmm. There is no measurable evidence. Also, if you take graphs of rises and falls of industrial activity versus the rise of CO2 in the 20th century, you will find that, the, for example, the Great Depression made absolutely no difference. That's a period when world production dropped by about a third. So what happens is that you get natural changes and cycles to do with motions of the earth, the tilt of the earth, the position of the earth in the heavens, and so forth. These have all been discussed. But They've been eliminated from the discussion by what I would regard as a fairly fascist approach to intellectual debate. If you challenge the thesis, I think there are three people on the left in the, in the United States and Canada that I can think of that hold my position. Three. <laughs> one is me, one is David Noble up in Ottawa, and the other is Denis Rancor in Ottawa. Why? Someone like Monthly Review, they'd never get a dime's funding from anybody if they came out against it. New Left Review, Mike Davis is a hysteric on these subjects. Just count up the times he writes the word epochal shift in his writing. A lot of people, I think, abandon Marxism, abandon political economy in favor of catastrophic determinism, if you want to know, because it suits the mood of the time. And then you get a sort of Promethean insanity whereby we, we humans, can fix the motions of the heavens and the stars and the weather, and we can fix anything if we try hard enough. Change climate now. It's completely insane. The level of man's contribution to climate change in terms of introduction of hydrocarbons into the atmosphere, as a friend of mine put it, is like a fart in a hurricane. 
a thought I mean, and a hurricane. I well, could go on for hours, but I won't. I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, at I, the moment, I, I we just, are, a, I just, uh, we I, are in an interglacial phase. Probably, right. most likely, we'll be entering a cooler phase over the next 50 years. We already are. Many parts of the world, the global warming, anthropogenic global warming lobby has collapsed because people say it's really cold. So, so there we are. Well, I mean, it's it's important to have all the positions stated. Uh, <laughs> I, I and I'm not. I just I just don't personally know where I stand. I I, I don't know if I'm. Uh, my anxiety is that even if one can negate, uh, which I think is an unresolved question. Well, I'll tell you what, your a normal person, defense to what you, I've been saying is saying, even if, even, if you're, even if we're wrong, we're right because we're doing the right things, if only for the wrong reasons. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, true. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, that's not you what I was going to that argument. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but there look are at, things. Look at, the way, look at the way that, you know, growing, growing corn for ethanol you know, is yet one more ghastly distortion of what agriculture should be doing. Yeah, well, that's uh, yeah. I mean, that's an excellent example in terms of, um, or I mean, you could look at the whole agriculture. I think that agriculture is, does not receive nearly enough emphasis in terms of its importance of how we relate with the economy. Yeah, because most of what passes for the left are people sitting in their computers in town. Exactly. Very few of them sit and actually know what goes on in the country. That's um, another problem. You know, but there are other things that go on. There's the devastation of the rainforest, and I just think that that's indefensible, regardless of what one's position may be on, on you know, to destroy all this, all this animal habitat in the name of, uh, you know, promoting so-called uh, industrial growth and things like that, you know. And so there is the possibility that, you know, the, the whole problem, one way or the other, comes down to reducing the environmental question to one to one variable, whether that be no. the that well, one of the problems is that the concentration on global warming, you know, the, in the cosmological sense, has stopped people very often looking at really specific stuff. Most environmental stuff is, you know, looking at a poison stream, uh, a poison field, uh, you know, the, the amount of high, uh, nitrous oxides going up power stacks and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But everything gets sort of like in British Columbia, the coal companies are running amok right now. But people kind of take their eyes off the specifics and they go into the global, unless we, unless we pass a new version of Kyoto, the world is finished. You know, we've, we've only got 10 minutes to save the planet. Of course, the absurdity of the Kyoto Protocol is that even if, you, if you're a partisan or sympathetic to the anthropogenic uh, hypothesis, it still is ridiculous because the by the accounts of people who maintain that hypothesis, the uh, restraints imposed by Kyoto and similar provisions are ultimately anemic, uh, cosmetic at best. Um, and really, the, those sorts of vehicles seem largely only to serve... Yeah. I mean, the other problem is that it's complete illusion. I was just reading another piece this morning, ban, the nation's got another issue, ban oil now, or you know, begin to ban oil. I mean... People have absolutely no idea of the role of hydrocarbons in, in the economy. You know, that wind and solar and tide, you know, really supply maximum about 5 8% of energy needs for the conceivable future. How do they think the whole show is going to stay on the road? I mean, because you begin with a level of reality, you end up with a level of absurdity. Well, I agree that say, what you have to admit is that radical... Radical changes have to occur because, uh, you know, even apart from the yeah, end. Yeah, but radical changes are, 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 are very welcome in your radical and I'm radical. But, you know, if you had proper enforcement of regulation, I mean, look at the, look at the blowout in the Gulf. Yes. You know, that's made in Obama land. <laughs> you know, the, the, I mean, as we've shown in the last two issues of our newsletter, two fantastic pieces by my co-editor, Jeffrey Sinclair. Mm-hmm. That, you know, it was the Obama administration that got the BP woman in who was in charge of issuing licenses in the Gulf. It was Obama who had a whore of the oil industry in the form of Interior Secretary Ken Salazar. It was Salazar who, who said we must go full bore in the Gulf. It was Obama who said that these days deep sea drilling is safe. It was, it was the officials they appointed in the MMA who turned their back and allowed a climate of lawlessness and corruption to flourish in BP. And... 
I mean, I would just add to that the the complicity. I mean, if you just you know follow the money and look at you know the fact oh yeah, BP was a huge contributor to the Obama campaign. And fact. and and Morgan Stanley, I believe it's Morgan Stanley. I should double check this. I believe they are the leading shareholder in BP, and they were among the premier uh, contributors to the uh, Obama campaign. So they were. Um, I believe. I should double check that before stating that. So, but I believe that that's uh, if it's not actually true, it certainly captures the spirit that you're looking at a person whose uh, whose overwhelming backing has been through uh, finance capital. So, do you want to talk about finance? I mean, not unless you want to say anything else about the environmental question. Yeah, feel free. Yeah, we got about I'm, I would say three or four more minutes to go. Well, well let me just give you an opportunity to. Uh, say anything that you would like to say that I have not given you the opportunity to say specifically. <laughs> that's too that's too big an order. All right. <laughs> well, uh, you, you have to ask a question you think I haven't answered. All right. Um, let me see here. Well, you know what? Why don't you elaborate on your notion of Promethean insanity? Because we've done a lot on the show about how technology has been so valorized by our society, and it really is ultimately incredibly disempowering to privilege uh, science and technology as it derives from the project of the Enlightenment to the degree to which uh, we have. And it disconnects us with each, from each other. And, and so why do you go ahead and tell me, what do you think about that? The way that we think that technology is the answer to everything and, and so forth. Well, it's bread in the bones. But I, I think the, I think... I think a gener- it doesn't quite answer your question, but I think that a lot of the problem is now that for, for 30 years since the birth of the environmental, well, not the birth of, but the you know, modern American environmentalism, let's say, kick-started in the early 70s, actually by Richard Nixon, probably, if you look at it, who, who set up the EPA. And, you know, he was trying to divide the left, of course. He was trying to do exactly what ultimately happened that, you know, the environmentalists really ceased to be leftists in any way. He was trying to split the anti-war movement and draw the Earth Day people away and all that. So you've, now, you've got people who for 30 years have been listening to clamorous warnings about, you know, water, air, and a lot of them well-merited. But the science was very often not that great. Um, the areas which they really concentrated on were very selective. You know, between um, you know the stuff on acid rain, the stuff on ozone, a lot of it was all nonsense. Ralph Nader, whom I like and is a good friend of mine, you know, he's basically surrounded by lawyers. He's a lawyer. Lawyers aren't scientists. Lawyers make cases. So in the end, you've got the evolution of a sort of catastrophist left. Who and and Ralph himself is no leftist. He comes out of the basically the consumer movement, the co-op movement. Indeed. And, you know, he's done tremendous work in an area where, you know, there weren't too many people around doing tremendous work. But gradually you've got a, basically a vast PR machine. Some of it beneficial, a lot of it not particularly beneficial. And that took people away from, meanwhile, I think people had a disdain for organized political work, long-term organizing. A lot of them went squirreled off in, you know, here I live in Humboldt County. You know, people go and they be- want to become marine biologists. I mean, half the people on the planet seem to... I mean, how much work is there for marine biologists? But it's a very virtuous thing to do. Uh, a lot of people just haven't got any real hands-on organizing work. I mean, there are tremendous people in the labor movement. But the labor movement's in terrible shape for reasons I barely need to describe to you, I'm sure. So... Then also, well, I don't know, then you can throw into that the whole Democratic Party stuff on top of it. Clintonism was an absolute disaster. Um, well, we just uh, don't have the time. We can go on and on. But <laughs> right. maybe we better call it a day until the next time we talk. Indeed. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it was lots of fun. Indeed. And lots of things left open, but that's inevitable with time and space pressed against us. So thanks again for joining me uh, this afternoon, Alexander. Absolutely. Hopefully we can have you on again in the yep. future. Do have a lovely day. So I believe he's off, so hopefully to hang up on him there. Um, so anyway, folks, there you go. That was Alexander Coburn, uh, founder, uh, co-founder and editor of Counterpunch uh, Magazine. And I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up ourselves here today. Um, 
uh, uh, in a few minutes, we'll uh, have uh, Lynn back on. We'll probably have uh, some music in the interim. I hope that uh, you found it uh, engaging. So, um, again, I hope you all have a lovely day, and I hope to speak with you soon. Bye.